So there's no doubt that the Jefferson Curl is one of the most powerful tools for building some serious hamstring flexibility. This is because it's easy to set up, it's easy to perform, easy to progress, and it can produce results for months on end. But there's more to developing flexibility than just doing the exercise itself and expecting to become more flexible. Just doing the Jefferson Curl isn't enough. There are certain training principles that we want to adhere to in order to make the Jefferson Curl really effective at developing our range of motion. So the training principles can be visually represented using a pyramid structure, where the most important principles are at the base of the pyramid, and those of lesser importance are near the top. The more of these principles that we can layer and stack into our training, the more effective that the Jefferson Curl is going to be to develop hamstring flexibility. So starting off with the first training principle, specificity. So if you want to use the Jefferson Curl to increase your hamstring flexibility, to increase your hamstring range of motion, then you have to perform the Jefferson Curl in such a way that's going to increase your hamstring range of motion. So what I mean to say here is that the Jefferson Curl can be performed with extraordinarily heavy weights. It can be performed with set and rep schemes that are going to maximize the strength and development of your posterior chain. And there's nothing wrong with that. I have trained that way myself in the past, but if you're looking to use Jefferson Curl to increase hamstring flexibility in a way that's going to carry over to body weight and gymnastic skills for things like the pressed handstand, then we're going to want to have a specific approach to how we use the Jefferson Curl. I recommend starting out with a really light weight. All you need here is the minimum amount of weight that will allow you to get deeper than you can get into when you don't have any weight. So this will be different from person to person, but somewhere between 5 to 20 kg will cover most people. The technique that you use for the Jefferson Curl will also fall under the bucket of specificity. Set up by squeezing your quads to lock your knees and then tuck the hips into a posterior pelvic tilt. You can think belt buckle to belly button to tuck the hips. Now tuck your chin towards your chest, round your shoulders forward, and begin curling your spine from top down, taking your time to articulate each vertebrae one at a time. Once we reach the lumbar spine, the hips will begin to transition into an anterior pelvic tilt and the spine will start to straighten out. Then keep letting the weight guide your movement until you reach a stretch in the hamstrings. Once you feel that first stretch, it's important not to rush out of it. Spending time in the stretched position is where the magic happens and what will build your hamstring flexibility. Before coming back up, squeeze your quads, reach further towards the floor, and attempt to come into even more anterior pelvic tilt. Think of pointing your tailbone to the sky. Now reverse the movement by driving your toes into the box, tilting the hips back into a posterior pelvic tilt and uncurling the spine one vertebrae at a time. There's a couple common mistakes that can occur with the Jefferson Curl. The first mistake is hinging at the hips. So rather than flexing the spine, rather than rounding the spine, we hinge at the hips and perform something that looks more like an RDL. What we want to do with the Jefferson Curl is to create an even bend across the entire spine. If you do this right, it'll actually look more like a fishing pole that just hooked a fish. The second most common mistake is not shifting the hips over the feet at the bottom of the movement. If you leave your hips too far behind your feet at the bottom, then you're simply counterbalancing the movement. You're not actually bringing that much load into your hamstrings. So in order to shift the hips over the feet, what you're gonna have to do is drive your toes into the floor or into the box quite strongly to prevent you from falling over. Now, not everyone is gonna be able to stack their hips directly over their feet, but it's the intention here that we're after. And some people may even be able to get their hips past their toes. That's what we wanna strive for. All right, and now the second most important training principle, progressive overload. So flexibility training is no different than strength training. If we wanna progress in strength training, then we need to gradually and consistently increase the stress on our muscles and on our nervous system. In strength training, this can be by adjusting the load, the volume, the tempo, the technique. With the Jefferson Curl, the primary form of overload is gonna be through range of motion. Where we're gonna keep the weight the same, we're gonna progress through increasing our depth. One effective strategy for consistently increasing range of motion is to use targets. This can be done by standing on an elevated surface and reaching towards yoga blocks. Over time, it'll become easier to reach the blocks and the height of the blocks can be reduced. Another option is standing on weight plates and reaching towards the floor. As we succeed on reaching towards the floor, the plates can be stacked higher and higher. And probably the most effective of the overload strategies is reaching towards a moving target. If you have a training partner or a friend around, they can place their hand at the bottom of your range of motion. And as you touch their hand, they can lower it further and further down until you reach your max range of motion for the day. Once you reach a point where progress slows down and you can't increase your depth from session to session, you have two options. The first option is to keep the weight the same and increase your time under tension. And the second option is to repeat the entire process again, but using a heavier weight. 
The third training principle is recovery and adaptation. There's this common misconception with flexibility training that we need to stretch daily, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Again, flexibility training is no different than strength training. If you're training intensively, if you're progressively overloading your flexibility work, then you will need to rest and recover in order to adapt. Like Nix always says, once is never and consistency is the name of the game. Rather than over committing and starting off with the crazy amount of volume, you're much better off starting with the bare minimum amount of volume that will still produce results. This is what's known as the minimal effective dose. Now, if you find that you're feeling good, you're recovering well, and you have time for more training, then you can look on adding a bit more volume to your training and seek the optimal training dose, right? This is something that's gonna provide a bit faster results, but not at a rate that's gonna injure you. Either way, my recommendation is to train the Jefferson Curl one to three days per week for three to five sets of three to five repetitions with a five to 10 second hold at the bottom of each repetition. All right, and now the fourth and the final training principle, variation. Now, the reason that variation is the least important of all the training principles is because truth be told, most people can train the traditional variation for months on end and experience significant results. But there's no doubt that training the same variation for months on end can get a bit stale. The first variation is the toe elevated Jefferson curl. Everything about the technique and movement stays the same, except the elevation of the toes will create more ankle dorsiflexion, resulting in a larger stretch to the calves. In general, pike flexibility can be limited by restrictions in the calves. So introducing variations that further stretch the calves can be beneficial to breaking through plateaus. Make sure you have the intention of stacking your hips over your feet at the bottom of this variation. Just like I mentioned previously, the less that you stack your hips over your feet, the less of a stretch that you're gonna experience. Now, this variation can be quite intense and it can produce some very nervy sensations behind the knee. If you find that that nerviness behind the knee is the predominant sensation that you're experiencing, then it can be really beneficial to perform a calf stretch prior to this variation. Now take it easy with this one, it is quite intense, so start off with less weight than you think you might need. The second variation is the reverse loaded Jefferson curl. Now, because the weight is behind the body, it slightly shifts the center of mass backwards, which actually makes the hip compression feel stronger and feel more accessible. So one thing that I like to think about with this one is trying to create even more contact between the torso and the lower body. Now, this variation, just like the toe elevated Jefferson curl, is a lot more intense than traditional variation, so start off slow. All right, and that completes our dive into how to use the Jefferson Curl for building hamstring flexibility. If you found the content helpful or insightful, feel free to let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one online coaching, you can find more information on my website linked below. And that's a wrap. I'll see you next time.